Okay, welcome to the third lecture in the course. Um, I actually, when, when like recapping last year, yesterday, I uh, made a decision that because in the recordings of this lecture, I said that man, this, I must split this into uh, more lectures because it was like this all the time and there were no room for questions and it was like really clogged. So I have made some changes today. Uh, there are two lectures booked uh, today, one uh, now until lunch and one after lunch. Uh, however, the one after lunch, I will postpone that to next week. And uh, today we could like focus on this fir first lecture. If it ends like at two, fine. Then we have an hour of questions if, if you want to get help with something. So, so we will have like an extra tutoring uh, this afternoon as well. Uh, the deadline for the first assignment is next week. And I said that we were to have three oral hearings in the course. Uh, we've changed that as well. We only will have two oral hearings. We will have one oral hearing for the second assignment and one for the third assignment. So the first assignment will not have an oral hearing. It will only be a hand in so that when the deadline comes, you should make sure that you have followed the instructions for how to hand in the assignment and we will have a look at it uh, uh, and give you feedback and that feedback will be given to you over GitHub. So you will get the feedback like as an issue on GitHub. So, so probably you will get a notification on your email that someone has raised an issue on your GitHub uh, repository. If you don't, just make sure that you look uh, uh, on a regular basis. But I think you should get an, a notification if you haven't turned them off. Uh, so only two oral hearings. The, the theoretical part that is uh, a part of the first assignment, we will kind of ask some of those questions on the second assignment. So, so you need to read up on, on the theories surrounding HTML as well. Uh, but not too many questions though. Um, we should, uh, the first oral hearing should have been next week on Wednesday, but because we don't have an oral hearing on Wednesday, I will be able to split this lecture into two. Um, so that's part of the reason as well. Questions regarding that part of the course? Yeah. Um, so the question is, I, I missed the le second lecture, uh, is it possible to just watch the YouTube uh, or is it different? It's the, exactly the same, we record every, everything. So, so the lectures are streamed and record, you can do whatever you like, you could like, if you're behind or you want to work uh, in advance, you could use the YouTube recordings for that. However, just be sure that when you look at the course page, you have different dates. So you have the 2016 version being online right now and I'm adding the 2007 version as we go along. Yeah. yeah, so feel free to do whatever you like. And I mean, this half an hour before this lecture starts, it's, it's just a, uh, a tutoring uh, and, and help uh, lecture. So, so, so if you need help, you can always attend on those. We have also added on Fridays, because some of you had to, by us in, in, in the UML course uh, this morning. So we added on Fridays at nine, I think, there is an additional tutoring pass as well. So, but on that one, we don't have a, ha, have a lecture room booked. So we will be in Kalmar. You write your Skype IDs in the Slack channel and we will call you over Slack and we will do it that way. Or, or call you over Skype, I should say. Eventually we will use Slack for communication as well, but we, we need a paid plan for that. And that's up and, up and running soon, I hope. Is it possible over Skype? Huh? Do we only have to do it over Skype? Yeah. Because I don't have Skype. 
Uh, so if you have Linux, it could be like a problem. We could always find an alternative way. Uh, so, I mean, we could communicate over Slack and we could find another way. Yeah. Uh, Slack, uh, Skype is a little bit problematic as well because some, some is using Skype for business and some is using the old regular Skype and those are not compatible in, in certain ways. So we will try to move away from Skype eventually. Uh, some of you have, have noticed that you are not able to publish on GitHub. So when you push your code, your HTML to Git and GitHub, uh, they, the code will not show up on GitHub pages and, and you only get a 404. Uh, we are resolving that issue right now. We need to do a manual uh, setting on each and every one's account, but we cannot do that until you've pushed at least one file to your repository. Uh, so, if you're just working locally, please just, just push what you have so that you have files in GitHub because then we could activate GitHub pages for you, okay? Right then, so um, today we are leaving like, as I said, HTML and CSS is not the main focus of the course, that's only a must-have because every web developer needs to know basic HTML and CSS. However, if you're supposed to work as a web designer, for instance, you will probably like have to do a lot more read up on, 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 on especially CSS uh, before you can make a living in that, that business. But we're, as developers, we need to know HTML and CSS to be able to create applications. Uh, so that's why it's a small, whoa. What happened there? So that, that's why it's a small part of the course. The big, big part of this course is JavaScript and the ability to, to add uh, interactivity to our pages or like build applications, L just like you are used to build applications in, in Java or whatever. So, uh, and as a prerequisite of, for this course, you have the, uh, some kind of programming course in an object-oriented language. I guess for most of you it's Java. Hands up how many has programmed in Java before? We kind of did this poll the last time, yeah. The majority. C Sharp, you are allowed to, to raise your hand several times if you like. PHP, C++, okay. C even. Haskell, not yet. not yet, a little bit, yeah, oh, okay, you are a couple, Erlang, Erlang, Erlang. Golang, Golang. Assembly. assembly, yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> if, 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 if we go back to assembly, that is as, as far we could, could possibly get from JavaScript, I would say, <laughs> that, uh, you, I mean, the, the common picture of JavaScript is that it's this like, or if we go back 10 years, it's like this toy language that you kind of make things spin in the browser or make silly things in the browser. Uh, this has changed a lot during the last, I should say, maybe 10, 12 years or so. Uh, today, JavaScript is regarded as a real programming language. It's always been a real programming language, but it hasn't always been, been seen as a real programming language. Uh, and the development of JavaScript, the language, is really serious and it's fast and there is a lot of things happening in the JavaScript community. Um, to be able to bridge between the languages that you have and JavaScript, we will have to, to, to like, look at the basic things in the language. I will not do this, I mean, we will go over the things, how to declare a variable, for instance, but we will do that in a way that suits you that already know what a variable is and how to assign, assign variables. Uh, so I will like focus on the differences between JavaScript and mostly Java, because if we look at Java, and C++ and C Sharp, 
and PHP, those languages all stem from the same kind of uh, background, that being C in the, in, in the beginning. Whereas JavaScript comes from a totally different stem. In, 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 in. And JavaScript borrowed the syntax from Java. So, so under the hood, JavaScript is a totally different language than Java. But looking at it, just visually looking at the code, it kind of looks like Java. And this is a bit problematic because you, you might be fooled in thinking that it under the hood works as Java, but it doesn't. So we will kind of look at the differences today and next week. After that, after those two lectures, we will focus on JavaScript in the browser. But right now we will focus on JavaScript as a language. You can run JavaScript in the browser, you can run it on a Raspberry Pi, you can run it like on a server, you can run JavaScript pretty much everywhere. You can run JavaScript inside of Adobe PDF documents. For you. So, so JavaScript is kind of a versatile language that you can run just like Java in many different environments. So we will focus on the, on the language today and then focus on the runtime environment being the web browser because that's kind of the biggest uh, uh, utility, one of the bigger utilities for JavaScript today. Okay, let's switch to that view and the first slide. So this is how you uh, hopefully will experience JavaScript. First of all, you can never have a JavaScript lecture without having a GIF animated GIF. That's like if you go to a conference, if there is not an animated GIF, that is probably not a JavaScript uh, lecture. So <coughs> those guys over here, they are like, and girls maybe, are uh, programming in Java. This will be you programming in, in JavaScript. Uh, so you will see that Java is kind of holding your hand all the time, just telling you how to program and you have a clear set of rules of how to do things all the time. In JavaScript, you can do things however you like, more or less. You can do things, you can, for instance, if you want to use classes, uh, you can kind of do that in JavaScript in three, four different ways. But you can also not use classes at all. So uh, you, some of you will absolutely love JavaScript. Uh, last year, some came from a background in Java and they took those courses and now they're working as web developers uh, uh, with uh, JavaScript in, in, in Vecchio. Some of you will absolutely hate this. That's fine. <laughs> then you know why you hate it, because when you've taken this class, you, you will kind of get a feel of what JavaScript is is some of you would like to have this more walled garden that is Java, that kind of tells you the rules. Uh, in later years, uh, the development of JavaScript has, has progressed and today many of the features that were lacking compared to, for instance, Java has been implemented in JavaScript as well. And I will uh, mention those as we go. Um, looking at the time, uh, timeline for JavaScript looks kind of like this. It was invented back in 95. Remember what I said with the web being like all this, just Microsoft adding stuff and, and, and other browsers, Netscape just adding stuff to the, to, to the browser, uh, kind of uh, making Tim Berners-Lee a bit, little bit angry. Uh, so when Netscape eventually came and said, to the V3C, the standard committee that, hmm, we have this idea. Can't we add like this JavaScript uh, uh, that we have tried in Netscape and like Internet Explorer have implemented in Internet Explorer that is called LiveScript because Microsoft weren't allowed to, to cop or, okay. JavaScript in the beginning uh, was developed by Brandon Eich uh, and he worked at the time at Netscape, I think. Uh, and Netscape implemented JavaScript so that you could like program in the browser. That was a really big thing back then. 
Uh, and Microsoft looked at this and, oh, we want to do that as well. But we can't just like, because Java, the name Java is, is uh, under the protection of, what was it back then? The Sun, yeah, Sun Microsystems, that owned the name Java. And so Microsoft couldn't just take the, the name, so they copied the language, they reversed engineered it down to the perfection. Every error in the language they copied. So lives, and they named it LiveScript and implemented it in, in Internet Explorer. So when V3C was formed and we started to talk about standards and, and, and coming together and help each other, they said to V3C, oh, we have JavaScript and LiveScript. Can we like standardize it on, on, on V3C? And V3C wasn't too happy about how those organizations had behaved in the past, so they said no. It has nothing to do with us, just go away. Uh, so they had actually, to, they, they looked for, uh, looked to Europe and an organization called ECMA. I think it's like, I can be so wrong right now. I think it's from Czechoslovakia. The, uh, I don't know if it's Czech or the Czech or Czech Republic or Slovakia, but I think it's in that region as well, or uh, somewhere in that region. Uh, and they said, yeah, sure, we can, can do this. Uh, Java is kind of hard of a name because Sun has the rights to Java, so we can't call it Java script, so we will call it ECMA script because ECMA was the name of the organization. So Java script and ECMA script and live script, they are all the same thing. It's like the language, JavaScript. However, the standard is still has the name ECMAScript. Uh, and we, on a daily basis, we, we just say JavaScript. Um, and the reason why it's called JavaScript and nothing else, uh, uh, I messed one thing up. <laughs> Internet Explorer didn't call it LiveScript, they called it uh, JScript, sorry. LiveScript was the name that JavaScript had in the beginning. But they changed it because back in the 90s, Java was the savior. It had like arisen to, 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 to make, every, Java was supposed to, to do everything right. You should be able to use Java in built-in systems, on the web, everywhere. Java was the thing. And to be able to, to like attract uh, money, they said, oh, let's, let's uh, name this, this language JavaScript, because it's kind of like Java. Brandon Eich didn't want it to look anything like Java in the beginning, but he was kind of forced to, to, to make it look like Java. Uh, the saying goes that Brandon Eich, who's, who created Java, he created it in, I think, 11 days. That is approximately so many days that you have for the first assignment. And he created the, the, the language that we know today as JavaScript. Uh, that's a pretty good job to do on 11 days, creating a whole new language. Of course, he was quite into language creation uh, or, or working with different languages. So he combined the best of what he thought was out there. However, if you create something in 11 days, you will end up with bugs. Um, and he did. <laughs> so JavaScript has a lot of quirks built into the language. And you will like look at them and say, how the hell could someone do it like this? Just remember, OK, 11 days. He didn't have time to fix everything. He also constructed the language in a way that Remember, HTML and CSS became successful because uh, it was easy for everybody to, to code in HTML and CSS. The browser would kind of fix things for you. He had this kind of notion as well when he created JavaScript that the language should be easy for everyone to code. We shouldn't like uh, get errors if we miss a semicolon, for instance. So, so, so semicolons was optional. Uh, um, and we don't have typed variables, for instance, where it's a loosely typed language. Uh, there are things like that that he built in just to make it easier to grasp. But in the end, when it comes to professional development, 
uh, those uh, things might end up bad in the end. So nothing really happened between, I mean, people were starting to implement JavaScript in the browser. Uh, JavaScript are often used to like scroll texts and just make silly graphical things on the page. Uh, but in 2000, and was it five or seven, um, when the term, uh, term AJAX was invented that we could just send uh, data between the server and the client, JavaScript kind of picked up uh, and the developers saw that, oh, we could actually build real applications using JavaScript and not only use it for those graphical things. So for the last 12 years, JavaScript has been rising in, in all statistics over uh, uh, the biggest or bigger, biggest languages in, in, in the world. Uh, some will say that JavaScript is the most widely spread uh, language nowadays because every unit out there has uh, direct support for, for JavaScript uh, if, if they have a browser installed. But I, I'm not sure about the statistics. And, and you can see that on the ECMAScript development as well. Nothing really happened until the late 2008, yeah, 9, something like that, when ECMAScript 5. This is like the first major good version of JavaScript. Uh, so after 5, y you can see that, and, and especially the, the, the later years, there is a new version coming every year. And I think this will go on for quite a while. Uh, so the latest standard is uh, uh, ECMAScript 8 or ECMAScript 2017. They changed like the form of the name in 2015, just to have the release named after the year. But they are often called ES8 as well. So be prepared to see both of those uh, uh, forms. Uh, ECMAScript 5 is like that is totally implemented in every browser out there. Every modern browser has support for ECMAScript 5. When we go up to ECMAScript 6, yeah, you need to be, uh, on, be on your watch because some browsers don't implement all of, of the specifications and you need to like check if, if, if every browser has support for the language features that you need. Of course, there are kind of preprocessors for JavaScript as well that will take your code and compile it to an ECMAScript 5 version. So, so there are tools like that if you really want to, to, to try out the, the latest features in the language. Uh, we will focus on ECMAScript 6 mainly in this course. There are some news in uh, ES7 and 8, uh, nothing really major, uh, mostly like handling strings and, and added functionality regarding that and some syntactic sugar as well. Um, we will look more at the APIs when we get into the browser and, and the news there. So, so it's, I mean, okay, so do I install ECMAScript 5 on my computer and, and like compile my files or how does it work? No, because you need a runtime environment for uh, for ECMAScript to work. So, so if you're using the browser, the browser is the runtime environment and you have to adapt to the browser manufacturer implementing features from the ECMAScript standard. Of course, you can look at sites and see exactly what features are installed in which versions of the browsers. Uh, when we start out, we will use Node and Node is a uh, platform for, oh, I'm not using the computer and it just will sleep. Uh, Node is, is a platform for, for running uh, JavaScript as well. And uh, Node is implementing the V8 engine. V8 engine is the same JavaScript engine that is in Chrome. So, so uh, because it's open source. Um, but doesn't mean that the same features are in the browser that you have in Node. Uh, but if you, if you install the latest version of Node, you will get good support for most of the features in the ECMAScript language. However, not all of them. Uh, so when you go about to install Node, I would recommend that you install 
the latest release, not the latest stable. The latest stable release you would probably run on the development or uh, production server, but in your case, just install the latest possible version and you will get as most, the most uh, uh, features as possible from, from the ECMAScript standard. And that's as simple as just, just visit node. I'm not sure about the address, but just search node uh, uh, and you will find the homepage and you just a one click installer. So it's, it's pretty neat. Um, so, okay, I could just show you that if we, oh, do I need to do that all the time? Well, um, I've installed Node on, on my computer. Uh, I'm using a small program called N, which is a node manager tool. If you install this one, you could like easily upgrade to newer versions of Node. Uh, the latest one I have is 8.4, um, and you can change Node versions. But that is probably if you are working on different projects, projects with different versions of Node. Uh, I'm just using it to be able to install the latest one uh, easy. Um, so I installed Node, and you could just write Node in in, uh, in 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 your Bash like this. And now we can start like doing some writing code. So one plus two is three. So this is, I mean, I'm not sure you can do this in Java, right? You can just start Java and start writing code and get a result. You need to like encapsulate in classes and uh, have a more structured environment and. So this is kind of a neat feature with JavaScript. You could just, you can write even in the URL field of the browser and start executing or opening the console in the browser and start executing JavaScript if you like. But you notice know, like this. Um, however, this is only for test purpose. So, so I will show you how to code in files in, in just a second. Um, In Java and most other languages, you have types like integers, strings, floats, and whatever. In uh, JavaScript, we don't. We, we have a loosely typed language, meaning that if you declare a variable, that variable could be a number. You can assign it a string. You can assign it an object, a function, or whatever. Uh, it's loosely typed. It, it's, it's not that JavaScript don't have types, it has. It's just loosely typed. And there are types, uh, but they are more generic than you are used to. So we have the type number, for instance. A number is floats and integers and whatever. It's just a 64-bit number. Uh, we have I would actually try to do this today because it's quite hard to see on the projector. <coughs> so if I paste it here. Uh, if you write type of 42, you will get the result number. So 42 is of, of the type number, 3.14 is a number, it's not a float, it's just a number. If you write a string, it's a string, so you'll recognize that. You have Booleans, uh, true and false, they are of type Boolean, so we have that one as well. We have something called functions, which are essentially objects, but I will get back to that. Uh, never mind that uh, writing that's also a function, it's called an arrow function and you might be familiar with lambda expressions in other languages. Uh, we have something that we use a lot that called objects uh, and we have uh, arrays and arrays if you write type off on an array it will show up as an object as well. So not too many types, we have some other special ones as well, we have un undefined and we have uh, null and we have uh, not a number and such, but those are kind of the basic types that you need to know. You don't need to know int 64 or whatever. 
Um, so let's have a look at the number data type. As I said, it's a 64-bit numbers, which is big. Um, they are can be negative or positive, of course. Uh, you can express them in different ways. Uh, you have your ar arithmetic operators, as you are used to, plus, minus, um, multiplication, division. Do you recognize this one? Modulus. Yeah, modulus. It's, it's, it's called modulus in, in Java. It's called the rest operator uh, or remind, remind, remainder operator in, in JavaScript. It handles neg negative numbers in a different way than Java, but you could, you could just use it as the modular, uh, modulus operator to check if something is even or odd, for instance. Works the same thing. And you have the parentheses as well, as you're used to. You have some special numbers, one called infinity, one called negative infinity. I rarely use them. Uh, if you have to use them, you're probably some kind of strange construction in your code. Uh, not a number <coughs> um, because, OK, we can, look, can do an example. So I will, instead of coding in, or we could actually start off by coding in the <coughs> terminal. <coughs> so because we don't have types, if, if you were to do this, in Java, what would happen? Yeah, you would get an exception because, I mean, that's an int and that's a string and you can't add an int to a string. However, in, in JavaScript, we can. So it will kind of recognize that this is a string, and it will do a concatenation instead, and adding <coughs> the string 12 to the string hey, making the result 12 hey. Um, however, if you do something like this, what's supposed to happen, you think? So you multiply 12 with hey. Hey, 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 12 times, uh, the string of 12, something like that. Oh, well, it's not a number. So this is a special type that is built in called not a number. Because, well, that doesn't make sense. So you get not a number. Um, Mm, forgot one thing that I was supposed to say, but whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, not the number is poison, poisonous. It's called so. So if you like, if you have an equation and you get not a number I into the equation, everything else will like be poisoned by not a number, and the end result will be not a number. Uh, of course, you can do things like uh, if we have this, what would happen now, you think? Oh, worked. So it tried to convert the string to an integer, and it worked. However, this is not good practice trying to like do this, so I would recommend if the intent is that this should be an integer, you have this function called parse int, for instance. There are many ways of doing this, but this is a better way of doing it, I think, because, okay, you're passing the one to an integer or a number, and you multiply it with one, so. Uh, well, I'll get back to that. Uh, strings. You know them as well. You can define a string with uh, as to f as single quotations. I, I, I would say single quotations because it's easier. So single quotations or double quotations. Uh, however, the code standard for this course states that you are supposed to use the single quotation for strings. Um, 
we are using a code standard called standard.js. You could check it, check it up on the web page uh, for it uh, with all the rules. I mean, when you go out and work on a company, you could write, as I said, you remember the dancing man, you, you can write JavaScript in so many ways and everybody has their own style. But if you work on a company, that's not a good thing. <laughs> if everybody keeps like, some are using tab for indentation and some are using spaces and some are using uh, uh, the brackets starting at the uh, end of the method and some are using brackets on their own lines. And that would just be a mess in the code. So you need a code standard and every company has a code standard even if you are doing Java or JavaScript or whatever. We are using the standard.js code standard that are gaining ground. Uh, we have used Google's before, Airbnb's is really popular, but we've settled with standard.js because the rules in this one really suits the course. Uh, and it states that you should use single quotation marks. I'm not saying that is the best. I'm not saying that it's the worst. I'm just saying that the standard says so and the course says so and you need to comply. That's basically how it is. When you run, for instance, we have, I think we have tests for some of our assignments. Uh, the tests will warn you if you have errors. And as, as you saw in my development environment here, I get some kind of problem with type off. Uh, and that is because I'm not compliant with the code standard. So uh, expected an assignment or function call. I mean, this is meaningless because I, I never saved save the result. So, so the code standard would say, I mean, it's totally legal JavaScript. It's not nothing wrong with the code, but we should do something li like that if we, if we want to, to do, use the type of operator. And now it says, oh, I isn't used anywhere. So that's the code standard complaining as well. Uh, could I use parentheses after type of yes, like that? Yeah, or like one without the uh, No. Uh, so, well, yeah, if, if this were a function, it should look like that. However, the type of is an operator. So when you use an operator, you need to have a blank space. And, and this is all code standard. You could, in, in JavaScript, you could do whatever you like, but the code standard will tell you that it's wrong. So you need to comply with that. I've done this as well. Uh, so say if I had it like this. So when I save a file, it will automatically just correct small errors. I'm quite, as you are as well, used to doing things like that, adding a semicolon in the end. It's kind of in my bones. So when I write code, it just happens. And it will punish me every time I do that. But if I save, it will remove it. So, um, And I mean, sem semicolons or not, uh, they actually doesn't add anything to JavaScript. Uh, having semicolons, it's just one more uh, character. Uh, there are some bugs that some situations where you can get a bug if you, uh, if you don't have a semicolon. But those cases, they are edge cases. You will never, all the way, almost never, be in a situation where you would need a semicolon. So for that reason, we are not using them and the standard says to not use them. It will actually be a lot cleaner code when we start using arrow functions or lambda expressions because you will not need to remember all semicolons on, on one-liners, for instance. Uh, we will see that later. Okay. But you will have to write uh, like everything on the same line if you want it to be, I mean, every operation. Yeah, you can't, you can't split like, you can't do things like that. Uh, you need to add it because what will happen is that the interpreter will actually add a semicolon for you before running the code. So this would be that. 
uh, which is totally legit code. It will run because type of nothing, it's nothing. And 42 is just run 42. It doesn't do anything, but it's legal code. So if you were to do something like this, you will end up with a bug. Yes. Don't split things up in lines. There are ways of doing that as well with like um, a backslash, I think. But it will warm for that as well. So, so there's no way of getting around it. Um, there are, I will link or have linked to a talk by, uh, have anyone watched MPJ, Matthias Petter Johansson? Uh, on YouTube, he has a um, show called Fun Fun Functions. Um, I, I would recommend recommend that uh, just have a look. He's he's really good at what he's doing, and he has a rant regarding semicolons. He he worked, I think he still does on Spotify, and he he he's Spotify is using semicolons, but he he like he doesn't like it. So, but he just complies to the standard that Spotify has. But on his videos, he's not using semicolons. I will link to the talk, or the, the talk is linked already to, to that rant. Uh, I will not dwell upon that anymore. You can concatenate strings, as you probably are used to. Just use the plus sign to concatenate two strings together. Uh, you can use the backslash n to make an escape sequence, uh, backslash t for tab and as you probably all familiar with. Nothing strange there. Uh, yeah, so what I should say is that number, string, boolean, they are primitive data types. So if, if, if you were to do some, oh, something like, I will erase this. Um, Ah, you see? Oh, line number out of range. Requested three. Oh, strange. Um. <laughs> what is this? Um, but they will just keep coming, right? I'm not, that must be the, uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, if I do something like that, um, because this being a primitive data type, it will copy the value. It's not the reference type. The same with strings, booleans. Uh, however, arrays, objects, functions, they are all reference types. <coughs> we will look more at that later. Uh, Booleans, nothing strange here, but you will see one thing. Yeah, let's make an example. Use this one instead then. Um, oh. Uh, okay, do it like that then. I want to go to, go to the top. Okay. Node. That didn't help. Clear node. Okay, now you see. Um, if I were to do, okay, so you will have to answer. True or false? Yeah. It's a little bit, is, is it, isn't it scary that that's true? Yeah. Is true or false? Uh, true. Ah, you're learning. So, uh, 
I mean, you were pretty good, but you missed the last one. Uh, I'm always like, oh, what is happening? And that is because we are using the double uh, equality that we are used to from Java. However, it doesn't work in the same way as Java because we have this loo loosely typed language. language. And because of that, we have um, three equal signs instead. This takes account the type. So in this case, that is false, which is a good thing because it's not the same thing. The string one is not the same thing as the number one. And one shouldn't equals true. But it should, of course, equals one. So using three <coughs> equality uh, uh, characters when, when comparing is a best practice and something that you should do. I even think that the code standard will prohibit the use of double, uh, double equality signs. So by using three, you are comparing the type as well. So the type needs to match and the values need to match as well. Okay. That's one use. Uh, of course, we have the not equality as well. So you use the bang <laughs> equal equal. Never ever use uh, equal equal and not equal. Uh, as you see, you can use like less than and larger than on, on strings as well. I'm, I'm not sure it's a good practice. Um, it will like compare the first letters, the second, and so on. You have the logical operators and else and false as well. Nothing strange with them. Well, actually there is. Um, because in Java, I think this will always return true or false, right? The, the, the double and and the double else will always return true or false. In this case, I think that else will return the truthy part of the comparison, which in this case is true. But, and I haven't prepared this, so now I will probably be wrong, but I think if you do something like Hey, um, if you do something like that, it will return hey and not true. So it will return the truthy part. You can use this to like get default, default behavior. So if we have a variable called uh, i that is undefined, uh, we can uh, let j equals uh, i or Mr. Smith. So if i is undefined, it will return the truthy part. But if i were defined, it will return um, uh, i. Or I could just write j, and j is Mr. Smith. Uh, so this is in this case, this is often called the default per, the default operator, and you can do like the opposite thing with the and operator, and it's called the guard operator. So if you have, you've you've probably been in in a situation where you you are comparing like my object dot hello. So if if my object dot hello is defined, you're supposed to do something. Um, we can do that like my ob dot hello dot um, is set. So, okay, let me explain this one. Um, so we have an object, my object, or think of it as an object in Java. You can look at this as Java. Uh, we have my object and we need to use the function is set, but the is set 
can only be called if there is a object hello inside of, of the object my object. This is quite usual in Java that you get an exception or when I coded Java like 15 years ago that you get an exception if you try to to call is set and hello isn't uh, an object. But by doing this construction you can make sure that uh, this one this one guards this one so to speak. So so if hello is um, set it will return this part instead. So it's the opposite against or. So in this case it's often called the guard operator because it guards the right side of, of the expression. But that's like edge cases actually. Okay, uh, we'll take a break, we'll take a 15 minutes break and after the break we will start looking at yeah what I already shown, uh, um, variables and how to assign them. Okay, so I uh, got some questions during the break, so I think I could address them for everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, when looking at the course webpage, you will find the exercises uh, down here. Um, this is exercises for part two of the course, and we could actually say that part two is kind of starting now with JavaScript. So these, these exercises are, are made so that you will get up to speed with JavaScript. They might be quite simple in the beginning, like this one, Tiny Tunes, it's like concatenate two strings and return the result and, and such. Uh, but that is just to, 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 to get you started. Um, on many of the exercises you can find, in this case, a code solution. So you could compare your code to the solution. However, bear in mind, we haven't implemented a new code standard on the solutions yet. So they will probably have semicolons, for instance. Just, just bear in mind that they work the same way, the logic is the same, but we have the old code standard. Uh, in some of those, I have those extended recordings. So this Bart board, for instance. Um, so in, in this one, I will code an example in the browser and I will speak uh, on the recording as well. So, so you can first you can try it for yourself and then you can watch my recordings uh, and, and, and solving this, this uh, exercise. Same thing here, notice the semicolons and notice that I'm using WebStorm which was the IDE we used last year. Um, and that takes me to the next point and that is uh, Visual Studio Code. So, we have moved from um, WebStorm, which is a Java program, kind of like Eclipse, and we have moved to uh, Visual Studio Code, Microsoft Visual Studio Code. Uh, as we discussed in the break, uh, Visual Studio Code is built or packaged, packaged with something called Electron, and Electron is a package, package a way of packaging web applications and running them on the desktop. So when you run uh, Visual Studio Code, you're actually just using a web application masked as a, or, uh, uh, or disguised as a um, uh, desktop application. Uh, if you scroll down on Electron, you will find other tools as well. Some of you know Atom, Slack, uh, Discord, uh, and so on, they are all Electron applications, which means they are written in JavaScript, HTML, and CSS in the uh, in, in, uh, uh, from the beginning. Uh, and we are using Visual Studio Code, uh, this one. Why do we use it? Well, first of all, Microsoft has always been really, really good in making developer tools that are uh, uh, great, like Visual Studio. However, Visual Studio has been only for Windows. Uh, but Microsoft has changed, made things open source, and Visual Studio Code is available for Mac, Linux, and Windows. Uh, it has a really good IntelliSense. It's a really stripped down 
editor, but you could add support for many different things. And you add support by using this extension tab. I've only installed two ex extensions, and you need to install one of them, and it's the JavaScript standard style. And it's this extension that makes it so that I could see all the uh, things I do wrong compared to the standard, uh, or the code style. This code icons, whoa, this one is just to get some like fancy icons like JS for the JavaScript files and so on. It's just eye candy. Uh, you can, if you like, you can use Git and the connection to GitHub and push uh, inside of Visual Studio with a graphical interface. I recommend you all to learn the basic commands in Git instead, because then you are not tied into a s special IDE, because that will work everywhere. So learn your commands uh, first, because there is always this thing with UIs that you can press something that you don't know what it does. It's harder to write a command that you don't know what it does. Um, okay, and we have an integrated terminal as well in Visual Studio Code. So if I open a project or open a folder in Visual Studio Code, I will also have the terminal point to that same folder in my file structure, which is a good thing because you don't need to do a lot of CD, yada, 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 uh, to navigate. Okay. I'm not sure why I got this error before, but now it seems to work. So we will, we will code in Visual Studio Code from now on. Questions? No? OK. Automatic type conversion. Uh, I talked about this. Uh, have a look at this example. Can I? No, I can't. That's not too good. Uh, that. Uh, so four, the string four plus three plus two will equal four three two. But if we do it the other way around, four plus three plus the string two, it will equal seventy two, and that's because the arithmetic is read from left to right. So it will take four, add three, it's seven, and then it will concatenate with a string. So the result is 72. There is a lot of bugs concerning things like this. As I said before, try to avoid like concatenating strings and numbers because it could be quite confusing when you're reading the code. But this is how it's done. It's called automatic type conversion. Uh, okay. Variables. Um, so in Java, you're used to doing things like int e equals zero, telling the compiler that I want i to be an integer. In a loosely typed language, we don't, do not need to tell the compiler or interpreter what type we are using. We're just telling it that we want a variable to store this value in. The classical way of doing that is using var for variable. And you can do this, and then we could like say that i should be a string, or like that. No, they're back. Why is that? OK, so I've written a simple, simple program. We create a variable i and assign zero. Then we change i from the zero to hello, and then I log i. And look, console.log, it's just like, what is it? Print line, something like that in, in Java, just to print it to the console. Uh, you run a program or a file by just writing node and the name of the file. And it will say hello. So this is completely valid. 
Of course, in Java Online 2, you would get an exception saying that you cannot assign a string to an integer. Uh, but it's not a problem in JavaScript. That doesn't mean that you should do things like this, like just changing the type all the time. Please don't. Uh, Um, we also, and uh, yeah, that's why I'm completely forgot myself. So, okay, so var is the classical way of declaring variables. You've seen it. If you've looked at JavaScript code on the web, you see var all the time. In ECMAScript, I think it was, they introduced two new ways of declaring variables. It's let and it's const. Starting off with let. So when declaring a variable, uh, like with var, in JavaScript you will get something called function scope. However, declaring variables in Java will give you something called block scope. Let me show you. If you do it like this, uh, or ah, whatever. If if true, it will be mad at. Oh, I need to learn this new code standard. Uh, if true, var j equals. This is not go good code, but. It will show an example. Huh? See? Cannot live without them. Um, and it fixed my spaces. So, if we run this in Java, what would happen? Would it, would it work? Would J be accessible outside of the block? No. But of course, in JavaScript, it's different, so it works. And that is because variables declared with var have function scope instead of block scope. So this is the block. But in JavaScript, in this case, function scope is the whole file. So this is the same thing and actually the interpreter will look at this code and it will rewrite it for you and it will look like this. Uh, yeah. So, oh, it removed the undefined. I had the undefined here just to, to make like a point. So this is what happens under the hood. So it will hoist, it's called hoisting, it will hoist the variable as a declaration to the top of the uh, function. It will set it to undefined and th then it will assign it inside of the block. And I mean, as soon as you use var, you should know that this happens. Yeah, and that is why you shouldn't use var because of this hoisting and you're not used to working like this. So today, more or less, everybody's using let, it, let instead. So if we do the same thing, but we say let j equals 12 and run it, we get an exception, just like in Java, because let has block scope. So it will not hoist the declaration to the top of the function. Okay? Of course, if we do something like that, it still works. That's the difference between let and var, okay? What's up with const then? What is const, you think? Yeah. 
Do you think this will work? No. 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 We we'll get some kind of exception saying that you cannot change i because it's a constant. Well, happens sometimes you need to dip maybe. Yeah, this is a classic. Okay, I need to use this pi in my application and I, I, I declare it as a const. And if you're in C, I think we did, you did something like you always had capitalized letters to, to say that it's a constant. This is not a typical way of using const. Uh, however, if we instead create an array like that, and then we do, oh, call it r. So log. Okay, will that work? It's like 50-50, I think, if I look at you. No? Yes? Okay, hand, hands up. Yes, it will work. I think it will work. No, it will not work. Yeah. More, let's try it. Uh, it will work. Um, and that is because what is constant is um, an array is a reference type. So the reference with this R will reference an array in memory. And as long as we don't change the reference, we could like add things to this object because the reference is the same. However, we cannot reassign this to a new. Even if, I mean, even if it were to have the same numbers, it's still a new array and it will not work. Okay. Yeah, you can pop as well. Um, so I, you will probably, I, I would recommend, I'm pretty bad at, because const is pretty new and I'm used to using var all the time. I would recommend you still to use const on reference types because if you create an object, you probably want that object to to be stored in that variable and not change. And if you especially when we come to declaring functions or methods, as it's called maybe in uh, Java, when declaring those, you will not change them either. So you can have const there as well. And use let for everything else, and you're fine. If you're using var, please be prepared for on an examination assignment, for instance, to be able to explain why you are using var and how the hoisting works. Well, you should be able to, 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 to explain hoisting anyways, but uh, we will be, be a little bit crueler to you if you use var, I think, on, on the examination. Um, okay, questions about this? I think it's pretty obvious, obvious and uh, if you're used to variables in other languages. Yeah. So if you create a variable with a let, but before an if loop, and then inside the if you call that variable, that still works. Right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so I need to repeat the question. So if I do something like let i equals twelve, if true uh, i equals so log i plus plus, for instance. Um, yeah, it will work. And what will be the result if I console log i here? Yeah, so you know your plus plus and your 12, 13. And what happens if I do it like that? Have Jonas drilled you on this? 13, 13, thank you. Yeah, so that's the same. However, using the plus plus, and the plus plus operator in JavaScript has been seen as not good practice. 
And that's because of a guy called Douglas Crockford. So Douglas Crockford is this like JavaScript evangelist. Uh, he's like, you will find in the JavaScript community, you will find memes, memes, memes about Douglas Crockford everywhere. Like he's, there are sayings like, if, if you pollute the global scope, Crockford eats a kitten and they're like, he, he's like kind of the god, even though Brian, Brendan Eich invented the language, Crockford is the more outspoken one. Um, he's in the standards committee uh, as well, working for PayPal now, I think. Um, and he has written a book called uh, JavaScript, the good parts. It, it's like <laughs> this thick. <laughs> And the JavaScript literature we normally use is this thick, and this is like the good parts. So he's kind of explaining why certain things in the language isn't a good construction. And he has a rant about the plus plus. Because, and, and, and the reason is many developers don't know the difference between plus plus and a plus plus. You did, obviously, but not everybody does. So it's, it's better to always use that construction instead. So you will probably see that many examples doesn't use plus plus and that's because in the JavaScript community it's kind of bad practice. However, the code standard allows it. So please do if, if, you, if you like. I, I will, it will not judge you in any way. There are reserved Names, of course, in JavaScript, you don't know, need to know them by heart, but as you know, in Java, when you write one of them, you kind of feel that this isn't right. Like naming something this, that would be a problem, for instance. Uh, of, a good thing is that when Brendan constructed the language, he, he like reserved the ver word class, even though he didn't have classes in JavaScript. We do now. And so it was a good thing he did. Otherwise, we would have to find another keyword, I guess. But those are, are reserved, nothing strange there. Uh, let's just, I will just go over those super quick because you know them. And, and, and you will see, here, here you can see that it's influenced by Java because it looks pretty much the same as Java. So control flows, if statements, Enough, we've already used them. Let's see what the code standard says about this one. I haven't tried it yet. Ah, oh, pretty good. I think not. Ah, I have. Huh. I have some, uh, okay, my code editor is set to use uh, the indention, in, indention of three, uh, four instead of two, but otherwise it worked. Uh, so if statements, else, else if, you know them right. Uh, no need to dwell upon that. Um, switch statements. I, I kind of find switch being this construction in the language that you use in programming courses and then never use after that. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's, it's quite common to have an a, a introduction to programming and, and you go over switch and you have these assignments that you are supposed to implement with switch. But then you never use them uh, after that. Uh, there are things to look out for, for instance, this fall through mechanism. So if you don't have a break in a case, it will fall through to the next case and the next and the next and the next. Making bugs in code. Some ninjas try to like take advantage of this and write cool code and it's really hard to interpret it. And well, I'm not a huge fan of switch. Use them if you like. The conditional operator. I found this expression, Turner. Can someone pronounce that? Turner. Is it the name of that operator? Okay. I didn't know that. I've always said conditional operator, but it's 
ternary operator. Okay. You're used to that one as well. Perhaps if you come from, I'm not sure if, if it's implemented in C++. It is? Yes. Okay. In C? Assemble? No. <laughs> um, so what it says is, uh, it's the conditional operator, it's the question mark and the colon. And if uh, this part is truthy, it will return the first before the colon. If it's false, it will return this one. So it's, it's nice if you want to like do things like this to test if something is odd or even, for instance. Uh, but it's there, please use it if you like. While statements look exactly the same as in Java, and do while as well, I guess. Uh, I, I haven't been coding Java since 2000. And I had a course in Java actually in 2003, I think. I, I, I haven't opened Eclipse since. So uh, pr there's probably happened a lot of things in the language that I don't know. Please correct me. If, <laughs> so if I have like a have the wrong picture of Java. Um, for loops, the, f the programmer's favorite uh, language construction. I guess or hope that all of you know your for loops by heart and love them. Well? They still use semicolons though. Huh? Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Those are the only semico semicolons that are in the language or that you need to use. <laughs> yeah, good thing they didn't remove those. That would be quite ugly. Good luck in interpreting that one. Um, yeah, they use the sem semicolons here as well. Um, I'm really fond of for loops. I use them a lot, used them a lot. However, since I'm, I'm teaching new students as well that haven't programmed before, and this construction is really hard to learn in the beginning. It's like a lot of things to get wrong. It's doing three things at once. Um, and it turns out in the newer versions of JavaScript, you will see that you will actually not need to use for loops anymore or as much anymore. So the, okay, let's skip in advance. We have time, I think. Um, yeah, we will continue after lunch. Uh, so I've already shown you how to create arrays in JavaScript. It's really simple. It's just using the brackets and you create an array. So if we have an array of say, all of those, and you were to sum them up, if you were using a for loop, uh, you will through probably do something like output dot length, um, and just, uh, no, uh, mm. Do something like that, and then log the sum. Have I missed something? Someone is shaking in the head. The index array. Maybe array index. Yep. So ah, sorry. Yeah, of course. <coughs> like that. Is it correct? Yeah. Wait, let's say it's okay. But there is a lot of things going on. So, so what I'm thinking about, oh, should it be less than the length or should it be less than equal with the length? I cannot forget to do this. I'm, I mean, for a new programmer, it's quite a lot to take in. And even for me, I, I need to think about it, even though this is the most classical of examples. However, there are really neat functions in JavaScript, ECMAScript, I think it's six, maybe five, that introduced uh, a lot of iterator functions. 
So, I will, sh I will show you how to do this now, and we will have the discussion after lunch why this works. And I really hope I will get this right. Uh, so, we take the output. Uh, we could, someone said something like for each. We could start off with a for each. Uh, so, for each number, uh, then I need to do something like. Um, Can do like that for each number. Um, uh, okay, then let me try it now. Are you testing? So this did the same thing as that whole for loop, actually. And we could even shorten this more and use something called reduce. Current pre previous sum uh, number uh, number plus equals sum, um, and I think we can remove that one. Let sum equals that one. I uh, hope I got it right. right. Yeah. Um, so what we are using here is something called iterator functions that iterate over objects or arrays or whatever you can iterate upon using the reduce method that will like loop every, every element remembering the old value and what I do here is just adding, uh, adding the old value all the time. Uh, however, this looks kind of strange, and this is called arrow functions. And, and arrow functions is something I will introduce uh, after the break. Um, what, what I wanted with this one was just to say that, OK, for all loops are the same. However, you will probably not need to use them as much as you are used to. You are allowed to, if you like. But there are better, better constructions in the language that actually makes the code easier to read as well, and you will get fewer bugs. Someone would raise their hand and say, well, the iterator functions, they are pretty slow. This one is faster, and it's even faster if I do a plus plus i because the compiler will kind of do some magic, blah, blah, blah. And then you have been to too many courses in compiler technology and stuff where you need to think about where you will use JavaScript. You will not use JavaScript when calculating quantum physics. You will use JavaScript for like handling data, transforming stuff, and you will probably have an internet connection somewhere in the middle. I++ and plus plus I, in comparison to sending a package over the internet, it's like, a drop of water compared to an ocean. It's like, don't even think about it. If you, in s at a workplace, write something really cutting edge, and you notice that you have some performance issues in part of your code, OK, fine, break it down. You will probably find that you have some kind of construction that is not suitable for what you're trying to do, and work with that. Don't try to do premature optimization because it, you will like only focus on microseconds here and microseconds there and then you will miss the seconds 
uh, in uh, other parts of the program. Uh, so just to sum up, there are better ways of doing things in JavaScript than using the for loops, even though for loops might be a microsecond faster than, or millisecond even faster than using an iterator function. It will probably consume a little bit more mem less memory, who knows? Probably the built-in functions will actually be better because someone has optimized them and the compiler can optimize them for, for their needs. So I don't know, I don't care actually. Um, okay, so after the break, the lunch break actually, uh, we will have a look at, we will continue with iter iterations, we will start looking at functions and uh, the more interesting parts of the language. We've just touched upon the more basic parts right now. So, uh, see you after the break at quarter past one. Uh, okay, so, so I just found out that there is some kind of clash between lectures in this course and in another course that some are participating in. So they have a lecture at the same time as me, as is right now. Good thing this is recorded then, so uh, those students can watch this recording later on. Uh, I got a question uh, before the break, uh, uh, and I would like to address that to everyone. Uh, the examination, the first assignment, there is a, a writing that is a little hard to understand, it's this one, part four. So the question is more or less, okay, so we are supposed to add like blog articles to this page. Should we do that in a dynamic way, like having a po field and post posts to this page? No, you're not. Fake it till you make it. Uh, it's just faked blog articles that you, you write. The, the most important thing here is that you have the semantics correct and so that every part or every blog post is its own article, maybe with a header and a footer uh, so that it's isolated. You just write them into the code. There is no need to, to dynamically add them in any way. Uh, what I mean by it should be easy to, 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 to add articles is that I mean the code should be clean, it should be easy to see how the articles like are stacked. I need to change that meaning. Yes? How long do the uh, articles have to be? I mean there's only so much. You can, you can fake the articles as well. Uh, just copy and paste random Lauren Ipsum text or whatever. Uh, it's, it's often good to have more text just to see how the page will behave instead of just writing hello, because that's not realistic. So try to mimic a uh, blog article, but you do not need to write it yourself. Um, I mean, okay, of course, you can't just steal someone else's articles, but you can take gibberish code or, or text. But you still have to answer these questions. Right? Uh, those questions, yeah, oh yeah, good, good. Good. <laughs> I have so many. Uh, assignments and, and in other courses it's not like this so yeah those questions should be addressed yeah but you could always I mean address them on top of the page and then you can add faked articles at the bottom if you like uh, yeah those questions should be answered uh, you can could, could if if okay so we will not have an oral hearing but if we had we would prob probably ask those questions as well. And we might on the second assignment. So to prepare yourself, you could answer them in, in the text. Um, anything else that has come up during the break? Okay, let's continue then. Oh. I need to do that. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, leaving the conditional statements and going into iterators, loops. Um, oh, well, we were on loops actually, or iterations. We, we discussed the for statement. 
Uh, we have break, we have continue. Works the same way as in Java. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of break or continue, but if you like, you're of course free to use them. Um, I will skip them. Uh, comments, making comments, you have more or less three different types. Uh, you have the single row comments. It's hard to see, right? Uh, I could say that you have those slides, if you have a computer, you have those slides on the course homepage. So you could always have the slides in front of you if you like and just go along. Uh, so we have the classical row comment. Uh, I think in this code standard that you can add them wherever you like. Yep, doesn't complain. Uh, in some code standards you're not allowed to do this. But this, in this code standard it's okay. In some code standards you need to have a blank line before a comment. Uh, you can in this one, but you're not, you don't need to have that. Uh, we have the multi-line comment, same as in Java. Nothing strange about that one. Uh, and we have the doc comments with two stars in the beginning. Uh, make it so we can have, I think you're used to, some of you at least are used to JS, J, J, Java docs, right? Yes. Yeah, so it's kind of the same format for JavaScript documentation and to be able to automatically uh, yeah, make documentation and also help developer tools understand your code better. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, if you, regarding comments, you need to, when we have the examination assignment, I mean, my, my philosophy in documenting is, okay, you're supposed to use JS docs comment because that will help us in the end. Other comments, use them when necessary. Don't over comment, don't like comment for your mother or father. I often see comments like this. <laughs> oh well, it's good if my father were supposed to read this, but. Um, so don't overdo it, uh, have comments where necessary. Uh, we will state in the assignment if, you're, if it's a must to have uh, JS doc comments or not. Uh, of course, I would like if you, if, you, if you add them, but if we don't say, you don't need them. I don't know, do you off in Java, do you usually have uh, Java? Yeah, then you're used to it, so continue. You will probably get some kind of good support in the... I haven't used this for Visual Studio yet. Oh well. You might find some extension that will do this for you, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, functions. You are used to methods, methods on objects in Java or um, in some languages you have the concept of functions that are not attached to an object. Um, and in JavaScript we have something called functions that works as you're used to methods. Um, you can Let's see, when you declare functions, you can do it in the sa exactly the same way as when you declare variables. So we could have let, let say your name and age, this is the function name, equals a function with its parameters and the block of the function. I think this is quite a logical way of, of looking at functions. I mean, we, de we, we create a function and we store it in a variable. And to call that function, we just call 
the identifier and add the parentheses and the arguments to the function. Um, there are some things though. First of all, try to when you, as I said before, when you declare functions, try to use the const keyword because it's not good practice to like try to reassign a function to something else. If you need to do that, I don't know, then you're kind of messing up for everybody who tried to, to, to read your code in the end. So I would say it's a good practice to always have, declare function with const. Um, I think you're quite used to, to how this works. I mean, we have a parameter and we match it with the argument sent to the function. However, if you were to do this in Java, you would get an exception. We are trying to call the function with three per, uh, arguments when it only has two parameters. Uh, JavaScript is forgiving, so it will just ignore this last, or it won't ignore it. It will actually be sent as an argument to the function but we have no way, nor e n no easy way to, to get hold of that third argument, actually. Um, hope it works. Yep. In Java, you could do things like this, right? Kind of this, at least. Yeah. Now, the, uh, in Java, the, the right function, the function which match the arguments will be called. It's called help. Overloading. overloading. Thank you. Uh, we do not have over overloading in JavaScript. Mm -hmm. There is no way since we don't have a hard type language, I mean name, in this case we, we kind of intend that that should be a string because it's called name, but there is nothing saying I can't do this or mix them up. Can you return any type of variable? Yep. Return is the same thing. You can, re whatever you return, it will be returned. You can return objects, uh, integers, whatever. Because we don't state that we are returning. Like in Java, you state that this function should return an integer. It just returns, and the function always returns. I, I will get to that soon. Um, so. What I did, I mixed them up. I, I, I mixed up the H and uh, the, the H. So hello 30, you're Ellen years old. And this works because we only concatenate. If we were to, to rely on H being an integer, we would get some kind of error or some bug in the code. And you would probably want to do something like that. But since we don't have, since this is loosely typed, you can send in whatever you like. And this is kind of a problem mm, um, uh, and, and one of the critiques against using loosely typed uh, languages. But can uh, you call the function with less parameters? Can you call, so the question is, can you call the function with less parameters? Yes. So if we do this, whoa. Run. Hello, Ellen. You are undefined years old. So in this case, age is undefined. I mean, you shouldn't probably play around with it. You should try to match the parameters with arguments. But there are maybe cases that, where this could be good. 
Can we throw exceptions? Yeah, I will show how to do that. Um, okay, so understanding the parameters and the matching against the, uh, the arguments, that is essential. Uh, you will, okay, so I, I will skip in advance. I mean, this is kind of how I learned to program. You specify your parameters and you like try to match them with arguments. I'm not sure if this is how you still do it in like Java, but the trend in JavaScript is that you often only have like, in this case, your name and age. You just send in an object and instead of sending parameters, you could create objects saying, okay, so this object has a name, that is Ellen, and it has an age, that is 40. And then inside of here, you do things like person.name instead. This is, I mean, now we do not rely on the order of something. It, we only rely on the person or the developer uh, calling the function, sending in an object with certain properties. But we will probably get back to that. For now, we we'll just do it like, well, we had it before, so I can do that. Um, okay, so return, or return uh, statements. Every function is in JavaScript is returning automatically. So you can skip this part. Um, we run it, it says undefined. So this function now is actually doing this. For us. So this is the default behavior of any function in JavaScript. Of course, often when we call functions, we want the function to return something and we return whatever we like, but we do not specify a type uh, in, in, in when we declare the function. Does it feel strange? Yeah. yeah. But you see, it's, you know, the man dancing on the mill work, mill, Mill, treadmill, um, yeah, you can do, it's, it's looser than Java. So what would the workaround be for uh, overloading? What would the workaround be for overloading? Oh, well, you would, would instead probably just send in an object of person, for instance. So, okay, you, you say, okay, we have, have something that need to operate on a person which could have a name, could have an age, could have telephone number and so on. And then you just need to handle it inside of the function saying that, okay, check if there is a phone number, if there is a phone number called that API. Uh, you, you, you could like throw an exception if you don't have a name and age because that's required or something like that. Mm-hmm, then we know basic functions. Uh, and this is just as we said that all function returns, okay? Default parameters, uh, you are probably used to them as well. So let's just copy this one. Oh, can't do that, I need to do it like that. Okay. Say your name and age. Parameters name and age. So I showed this before with a, a, a default operator. This is the old way of, of doing things. So, okay, this function, <coughs> uh, we want the name to default to no name. And we want the age to default to 18. Since we didn't have default parameters in, in JavaScript, this was the way to do it. So if this is something, something is returned to name. If this is undefined or null or an empty string or s probably zero, 
because of reason, this will be returned instead. So this is kind of creating default parameters. However, in, uh, since I think ECMAScript 5 could be 6, we have default parameters, so you could do it like this, like you are used to. And we can skip those. Hopefully it will work. Hello, no name, you are 18 years old. Good thing. Something that has been missing and been added from other languages. So that's, that's a nice, nice feature to have. Oh, it's six. It's, it's so hard because ECMAScript 6 is ECMAScript ES2015. So the five and the six makes everything just mix up in the head. So it's ES2015 ECMAScript 6 that added that feature. So this could be a feature that you, I mean, if you're developing for Internet Explorer, you will probably not have this feature. Uh, so you need to be kind of careful. But if you're developing for Internet Explorer, you will be careful <laughs> in, in so many ways. So, okay. Remember I, I talked about hoisting uh, and I talk, talked about uh, uh, block scope versus functional scope. So starting out with this example, I would just, well, I missed something, right? Yeah, no, I didn't. There are many things going on here. Okay, so first of all, just we, we look at the three rows inside of, of the function. We try to log the variable, then we create it, and then we log it again. And it's not a good thing that I wrote what it will end up with, but we could run it anyway. It says undefined and 10. So this one logs undefined and this one logs 10. Why do, do we not get an exception on this row? Because of hoisting. Because this is declared with var, this will happen. This variable will be hoisted to the top and declared down here. And now we can see, okay, so the, the, the variable is created, but it's undefined. Then we log it, says undefined, then we assign 10, and then we log it, and it says 10. So this is hoisting. The same thing happens with the function. So if we just do something like this, it says test, but what do you think will happen if we do it like that? Suggestions? Undefined? Once again? Zero? No, no, same. Yeah, the same as the last. Yeah. Exception. What happens here is even though we are declaring with const, even if we were to declare with var, just to show that the, there shouldn't be a difference. Still an exception. So this happens. So the scope is undefined. We try to run undefined as a function. And that will throw an exception saying that the scope is not a function. Because undefined is not a function. So when you declare function is in this way, the order matters. You can't execute a function that you have declared later in the code. Oh, well, that could pose a problem in certain applications. Um, there is another way. This way, the function declaration that I have shown here. Uh oh, yeah, uh oh. I need to check if it's called declaration or I'm always messing. Oh, 
Where are we? <laughs> How? Yeah, he's dancing still. Stop. Thank you. Uh, oh, so this is a function expression. Uh, so the way of writing the, the function, the scope, like this, is called function expression. It's just like creating a variable and declaring it a function. However, there is a other way of doing this, which is more commonly used, and it's like this. Whoop, function, the scope. So we basically, whoa, okay, like that. We basically throw every, everything around. We say, okay, we have a function called the scope, like this. If we try this application now, it will work because when we use the declaration like this, the whole function is. I'm not sure if I have like a key that is beginning to break, that it's like spamming it. I okay, okay. I give up. Oh well. Um, so this is what happens. The whole function is, is hoisted to the top and now we can call it because it's, it's always declared wherever we place it in, in the scope. I would, <laughs> there are probably as many discussions about this as using c semicolons or not. Uh, I would say that from a pedagogical point of view, I would actually argue that this way is better. <laughs> because this will make you understand functions better. And I, I, I will come back to why. Uh, so I, I, I tend to prefer this way. It of, often, often it doesn't matter because you attach the function to an object like you have methods in, in Java. And then the order doesn't matter because you, you call the function on an object. And, and, and then the order doesn't matter. It's, it's just when you're recalling functions that are written loosely like this and not attached to an object. So it will not matter so much in which order the, the, the functions are declared. Yeah. If you define a function using the function keyword first, will it be constant, the name? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, so if we do it like this instead, the scope, will it, but you, bah. is it something like, do I need something in the top to stop? That's strange. Is it declared as a constant or is it declared uh, as a, a, a var? I'm pretty sure that it, mm, it's declared uh, with var and we could try it like, If it was a constant, this should the, uh, be an exception. It, it's no exception, so it works. However, if I were to do, do it like this, const the scope, this will uh, be an exception because it's const. So, so I would say it's a var, actually, yes. if, if, you, if you use the other notation. Um, Oh, thank you, silence. Um, 
Yeah, so I will write an example, but just a small one. Uh, Mm. If true, What will be logged when I run the scope? When I run the program, I should say, what will happen? What is the first thing that is logged? Undefined. Why? Undefined is that? Uh. Yeah, because we haven't called the function. Mm -hmm. So this one will run first. Uh, J isn't defined, so it will say undefined. Then we call the function. What will this one log? 10. Exception. J is not defined. Uh, yeah. It's a good guess. I, 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 I was w with you almost. But what happens with this one? With the J? Where is it valid? Inside the scope. Yeah, inside the scope. And we, the scope in this case for J is the function, because we have functional scope. So what happens is this, var J, it's like that. So we can't call it outside a function, because we have functional scope. However, so this one doesn't work. If we were to, to have it like that, um, and we change this one to let instead, will this one work? No, because now we said that J would have block scope. So function scope and block scope, and that's the difference. If we don't have a function, the file is executed as a function in Node. It's a little bit different in the browser, but we come to that later. Um, well, when, when we're discussing f variables, if we do it like this then, let hello equals hello. Uh, so we have a variable here. We have a function, we log hello. Will this work, you think? Yes. Hello, yeah, it will work. If we do it like this, what will it say? Will it say hello or test? Test. So we have a What's the English word? Over. Is it overloaded as well? No. Over. Shadowed. Shadowed. Overwrote. Override. Thank you. We over. Wrote. Over. <laughs> We've overridden this this variable <laughs> with the parameter inside of the function. Um, so JavaScript will work like this. When you try to access an identifier, hello, inside of this scope, it will look inside of the scope for this identifier. If it can't find it, if we don't have an identifier with the name hello, it will move up one scope and look in the scope above. And it will do this all the way up to the kind of global scope, the last scope. Uh, if it doesn't find it there, it will raise an exception. Um, yep? Could you have a let that's 
expression inside the function? So you could say like let hello and some other value? Yep, uh, you can do it like this. Uh, hi. Now, this is a local variable and this is a, a, a variable outside of the function. So they are completely different variables. They are, have their, I mean, they are on different, in the stack, they are on different places. Uh, they are in the function scope and in the scope outside. Uh, this means that we can do things like Damn it, sorry. We can do things like this. Will we be able to call the scope now, you think? You misspelled const. I misspelled something? Yeah, out of function, const. Oh, thank you. That's why it's red. Okay. Will we be able to, to, to access the scope from here, you think? No. No, you can't. Uh, because that's inside another scope. However, we could, of course, do something like that and call the outer function. Sorry for the semicolon. And it works. Uh, so we can nest functions inside of functions, and you see that hello still works. No, we do not see that because I added that one. Now we can try it, and it still works, it finds hello. So it will look inside of the inner function, it doesn't find hello, it will move up to the outer function, doesn't find hello, and then it will move up to the global scope. So if we do let hello, equals hi here, ho, 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 it will find this one before it finds the outer one. Okay, it's, that's how it works. Okay. Uh, functions that are not named, we often call anonymous functions. And in this case, we could, I mean, this is completely valid JavaScript. Like that, it doesn't do much, but, oh, it's not valid, sorry. Uh, it, we could probably make it valid. No, couldn't. Uh, damn it. Uh, well, anyways. Uh, this part of the function, if we don't as assign it to uh, a variable, this one is called an anonymous function. And in JavaScript, we have another concept, and that is called higher order functions. And Functions in JavaScript are higher order functions. That means that functions can be sent as arguments to other functions. And now we're starting to trip out. I mean, we could like create functions and we could send those functions as arguments to other functions so that other functions can execute the functions we send to them. In the same manner, we could return functions from functions. So you could call a function and get a function back and then execute that function. And that is the concept of higher order functions. And that is why I like this notation better. Because this kind of implies that a function is nothing more than just something you store in memory in a variable. It's just a reference to something in memory. Happens to be a function, but I mean, you could store objects, you could store 
uh, strings and integers. I think I have an example that I will copy. <coughs> oh, we have it here. Yeah. Let's do that. Oh, it's so hard to... Let's call it just get. This function get will return a new function that will console log hello. Okay. And we call get. We run it. Won't do much. Nothing actually. But what did we get back from get? What did get return from get in this case? A function. So we could do it like this. So we're calling get and what is returned we store in a new variable called say hi. And say hi is a function so we could call it like that. Hello. Of course you don't don't need to store it in a variable if you don't like. You could just do it like that. Have you worked with like uh, what's it called Ma matrixes uh, like three-dimensional arrays, arrays inside of arrays, then you're familiar with the concept. I mean, nothing says that this couldn't return a function, and a function, and a function, and a function, of course. So running this, hello. And I think it's easier to understand functions when you see that you can store them in, in variables. This one, does it have a name? No, it's an anonymous function. Doesn't have a name, it doesn't have an identifier. So we cannot access that function without first invoking get and getting that function back. Of course, we could take the reference to that function and store it in a variable and it's not anonymous anymore. We have a reference to the function. What happens if I do this? What? Uh, will that work? Yes. I mean, say hi is a reference to that function. What this does, row 10, is that it takes the reference and assigns that same reference to what. And so we can say what and we can say hi. Hello, hello. Now you can add another one and you could like have references to, to functions. Is it confusing or is it kind of make sense? Ka kind of confusing, kind of makes sense. When the hell are we going to use this? <laughs> we will see. Yeah? Yeah, I just wanted to ask when are we going to use this? <laughs> okay, that was the question. Um, no. Yeah, it will actually, that the example I showed with like iterator functions, it, it made use of this. Uh, so, but we, we'll get there. Uh, we just need to understand the con concept of higher order functions that are actually a powerful concept. Uh, This one I've already done. Think, yep. Okay. This way of writing functions
is the good old way of yeah. We could have okay. I will add one other concept actually. I, I will add the concept of pure functions. Have you heard the concept of pure functions? No. Functions without a side effect. Make sense? Have you heard it? Okay, so that this is actually that is a concept of. I mean, when you call a function, let's see if I can do it like this. I have, yeah. This is our function. We call it with x and y, and we get z out of the function. This function does not have any side effects. It doesn't rely on anything more than x and y, and it will not alter anything outside of the function. So that so you will be sure that if you set set x to something and y to something, you will always get set back. There will not be kind of a, a clock or something that alters the result when you send in. So, so given two two arguments, you will always get the same result back. And this function will not alter anything outside of it. Like try to put something in a database or change the value of an object somewhere. That is that is a pure function. So if I I mean the difference between this, if I run that that one, whoa, mixed. It says hi. This is a pure function. Because it will always return high if we don't have an argument. Of course I could have like x and y and return x plus y. It's still a uh, pure function because this one, if I send in 10 and 3, it will always return 13. However, if I do this, I would say this is not a pure function anymore. It's exactly the same. I've just moved the console log inside of the function, but I added side effects. So when running the function, the side effect is that we will get something written in the console. So this is not a pure function anymore. And often we want to strive to try to write pure functions because, first of all, they are much easier to test. The test a pure function is it's really simple to test the functions that rely on other things. It's harder to test. Um, I just wanted to, to, to like let you know the, of the concept of pure functions because you will probably find it in the book and when you check on online reference and such. So pure functions or functions without side effects. So that's why we should like try to return the result and if we would like to log the result, we can do that outside of the functions instead. Somewhere in our programs, we probably will need some kind of side effects, right? Uh, uh, especially we, when we are working with the web, we will need to alter the user experience in some way, change the behavior of the page. Uh, but we should maybe not try to mix that with the logic of the page. page. And we have the MVC and you know, yeah. Okay. We will take a short break, and after the break, we will find even another way of writing functions. Because as I said, you, in JavaScript, you can do things in many different ways. And in ES6, we got a new way of writing functions. So we will have a look at that after the break. Always uh, get exciting questions during the break. So I have one new question I will address. Um, Someone asked me about the, uh, let's see what it was called, enhanced for loops in Java. They are like for string, oh, it's string, right? Uh, str colon array. And you will, str will be the content of an array of strings every time this loop runs. The, 
this is kind of like the newer for each that I will show you soon. But we have something in JavaScript co called for in. Uh, like this, so you have for var key in my array, then key for each iteration will be like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. However, this one is kind of, if you look in, uh, in the good parts, Crockford will probably tell you not to use it. And that is because in the old implementation of JavaScript or standard, it didn't say in which order the key should return. So that's totally up to, to the inter interpreter. It could be like, if it's an array of three uh, indexes, 0, 1, and 2, it could be like 1, 2, 0. You don't know. And that could be differ, differ from different interpreters. So it was like, don't use it, because you really don't know what will happen. I think most of the interpreters will, will go from 0 to, to length. Uh, yeah, isn't this mostly used for object? Yeah, it is, but I haven't touched upon objects, so that was why. I think if you, there is some kind of snippet, I, I kind of, yeah, no? There. So you, you use this to iterate keys in objects, for instance, uh, but we will touch upon that next time. Uh, okay, as I said, you can write functions in other ways. One problem with this is that when we start looking at methods, uh, oh, that is stepping ahead. Okay, so we, first of all, this is one way of writing functions. There is another way called arrow functions. And this is what is in other languages, I think, referred to as lambda expressions. I think we have them in C sharp and we have them in Java as well. So if I were to write this with arrow function, it would look like this. Um, Oh, messing up. Okay. Say hi to. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, 12. So those two are the same thing. This is just another way of expressing it with an arrow function. Do you need to have it on the same line? Do you need to have it on the same line? No, you don't. And I mean, if the, the function grows, you will probably have it like that instead. However, there is a short, and I said this is a um, side effect. Often we do not want side effects, so we will just do a return x and y. If you do that, you could remove the brackets and the expression on the right side will be automatically returned. So those are the same thing. Hopefully it doesn't work because we need to log it outside instead. Okay, 12. This is a much shorter way of, of, of writing it. There is a difference when it comes to scope as well, or binding uh, how the function is invoked on objects when we talk about methods and, and how this will be handled inside of the function. But uh, that is for next week when we start to use classes and objects and, and things like that. But this is a shorthand. If we only have one parameter, we could omit the parentheses. So we could do like that. 
hopefully it will be 20. And as it turns out, this kind of syntax is really neat when you start using map, reduce, iterate the functions. Because you can write quite easy to read code on one line that chains a lot of function calls together. And remember, if we want to be advanced, this one, no, we don't. I mean, this one, of course, could return a ar new arrow function. But then the, the, the code will start to be quite hard to read. Uh, so that's an arrow function. Yeah, nested scopes, I, I've, I've touched upon this already, but inside of uh, outer scope, you could have functions in, inside of a function and they will create their own scopes. And of course, as I said, outside of the outer scope, you can't invoke functions of the inner scope. Sorry, if, uh, I forgot to change the image on this. Um, but I've shown that already, so that shouldn't be a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we get to the concept of closures. And closures is kind of hard to grasp the concept of in the beginning. Uh, but you could say that closures are, or well, we could run the example instead. We start off without using arrow functions. So what we got here is a function called multiplier, which will return a function in itself. That means we could use the multiplier to create new functions that will multiply with a certain number. So if we want a function that always will multiply with two, we could call multiplier with a two and get a new, new function back. And this function twice will always m multiply what you send in to twice by two. So by doing this, um, we take advantage of something called, uh, <laughs> I forgot, closures, thank you. Uh, we take advantage of something called closures. And we say that, because if, if we look at it, what happens? So we run the function multiplier with a two. So factor is two. We return a function that takes a parameter number, which takes that number and multiply with a factor, which we know is two, but this one, this function returns, it should like return everything to the stack, right? So the two should not be in memory anymore. But when we call twice this function, it has access to the two still, even though multiplier returned ages ago. And if we run it, 10, so works. And this is the concept of uh, closures. We say that the inner function has a closure to the outer function. It actually remembers the outer function's variables so it can access them even though the outer function has returned. You can do some really trip things with this one. It's not too, too easy to, to, to get your hand, head around. If you thought recursion was hard, this is like, whoa. 
uh, could you do recursion with the, I mean you, you, you could always do recursion um, uh, because you can always like call multiplier with something if you like and uh, yeah I don't want to spontaneously do a recursion example because I will probably mess it up uh, so this is a concept that is good to know that an inner function can always access the outer function's variables, even though the outer function has returned. If we write that one, this should be in the beginning of the lecture, because closures is probably the most hard to get thing in JavaScript. Uh, so this is the same example. However, I've replaced and uh, I'm, I'm written the, the, the inner one with an arrow function instead. Uh, and I don't think you need that one. Let's try it. 10. So the multiplier will return a function that takes that factor, multiplies it with that one. Uh, so, so this is the same example, but, but with an arrow function, yes. Uh, so if we do like this, ten and eight. Yep. I one once again slower. Oh, sorry, I'll, 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 I was just wondering. Now it's not a closure anymore. So if I call like let's say let triple equal multiplier and argument at least. And then if I call that twice again, will it remember a factor as two? Uh, the, yeah, it it will. Uh, no, uh, is something wrong? Mo yeah, I, I mo the ah, like that, right? Eight, ten, and eight, and we could, of course, call triple with four. So, and that that's a really good question because that shows like that every time you call multiplier you get a new closure so so if you call multiply 20 times you will have like 20 functions with closures to 20 different values even if those values were the same uh, yeah it eats up a little bit of memory but it's worth it uh, probably in the end exactly um, um, there was another thing I thought about uh, no, forgot it. Yep. Is there like a preferred way of defining functions, like arrow functions? Is that kind of a new thing, or is there a preferred ways of defining arrow functions? Uh, uh, functions uh, um, like we have this new way and we have the old way I would say it depends as we will see in the next lecture when we start to create methods on objects uh, you will probably find out that using arrow functions could be quite neat because there is one thing I haven't told you and that is that arrow functions and functions handle binding of objects differently um, and arrow function handles that binding as you are used to in Java. So if you are creating a method and using this inside of the method, this will reference the object. Seems quite, yeah, of course. <laughs> However, if you're using this notation, you could, could en end up quite often in cases where this will refer to another object, which will pose a problem. 
because in a function this will refer to the object calling the caller of the of the uh, the function so let's see if i could just no no i i, I think i need to 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 introduce classes uh, b before that but there is there is just bear in mind that there is one technical thing that differs functions from arrow functions and it's really important when it comes to 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 classes and i think i'm pretty sure that the class syntax the new class syntax will implement has arrow functions under the hood or the same implementation as arrow functions uh, so so you will feel right at home if you're used to java I mean, most often you will probably have the functions attached to an object, uh, but there are cases when, for instance, in in the browser, if I were to just write like that in the browser and execute my code, hey, this variable will be part of the global object in the browser. That is the window object. That means that if we have different scripts running on the same site, they will all share, this will be a global variable. It will be shared for all scripts executing right now. And it could be quite a lot of frameworks and other kind of libraries that you have included in your code. And they all share this global memory. That is not a good thing because someone else could name their variable to hey and you will get like those will mix up. So then you could like use functions to do something like this. Let's see if it works first of all. Yes, it does. So what I've done here is that I've created an anonymous function that is what we call a self-invoking function. So a function that calls itself. We declare the function and then we call it directly after the declaration. There is no way to calling this function ever again because we have no reference to it. It will not say, be saved in a variable. It will not pollute the global scope because it will just create this bubble and we could work inside a bubble. So hey will be inside of this scope. We cannot access hey outside the scope. Failure. So this is quite a common way of encapsulating things in the browser. You will probably see if you like look at libraries and stuff they will probably have some kind of construction looking like this just to hide the code from the global context so that other code code can't access this code but you wouldn't have that problem if you were using let statement uh, but you wouldn't have that problem if you were using let statement yeah you would even even if i would to do this AI would be a global object. Um, however, when I'm coding right now, I'm not in the browser. I am in Node, and Node will handle each file as an indiv individual scope. So, so there is actually no, no need to do this. We will look later on on modules like div dividing our code into different files and modules and importing and exporting or requiring and exporting. Um, but right now, when we just write code in Node, we don't need to care about this. If we were in the browser, we had to care. So if I open the browser window, we do an, you can do an inspect, then you could go, go to the console and you could like start writing JavaScript here if you like. 
and this, this script will be executed in the context of this page. Um, if I do var hey equals 12 and then start um, exploring um, yeah we have window there if I look at the global window object we will probably somewhere down the line find a variable named hey and this is not too good right so uh, we could like mess up things we could say that oh this focus function let's focus Focus equals So what I did I, I over uh, have Whoa Fuck Oh what that was before right yeah uh, so so what I did did was I, I, I I've overridden the, the built-in focus function that function is on this web page that function is not working anymore because I I assigned it to another function I mean in the beginning of the web I mean web pages weren't supposed to be that complicated I mean simple script and that's fine but today if you look at Facebook or any big like web application you have so many libraries working together and this is kind of a problem if, if scripts try to, to like alter built-in functions. It's like you could just in, I'm, I'm not sure, can you, can you like override print line in Java? And it will, not sure, <laughs> why should you? Oh, well, um, but you could do all kind of creepy stuff in the browser. And uh, uh, this is, yeah, this one is, is one way of like trying to, to to get ourselves in, into a bubble and, and, and don't do the, those things. However, uh, regular expressions. How many love regular expressions? Hands up. Oh, you are a few. There is a saying, you know that, right? If you're trying to solve a problem with regular expressions, you have two problems. Okay. No? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of regular expressions. They are quite useful sometimes. Um, you can use them in the same way as you do in Java. So you add a, a slash and then the regular expression. Um, you can do things like replace, find, search, and match, and whatever. It's, it's in, in the language. You have a resource here if you want to learn more. I, I, I will not go into detail about regular expressions. Got a question about error handling. Uh, uh, can a function throw an error and it can looks just I think like you're used to write uh, in the standard JS I just want to mention you always need to act upon the error in some way you cannot just do like this because standard will say standard JS will say that error must be uh, acted upon. It's just, just, just something in the, the, that library. Um, you have the finally, you have the throw new error and you catch. This looks kind of like Java-ish as well, so shouldn't be un too unfamiliar. And new is a keyword that is not of, that often used in JavaScript. Uh, you will see it now and then. It does more or less the same thing that in Java does creating a object, an object from, um, from a prototype function or a constructor function, which is kind of like a class, but we will look at that next time. Okay. So to finish it off, what we have learned today and
this pretty much sums it up. It, it, I think it's quite beautiful and simple to create things in JavaScript. If you want a number, you just assign a number. If you want a string, you assign a string. If you want a boolean, you said true or false. If you want a function, you can use this arrow function syntax. If you want a regular expression, you use the slash slash. If you want an array, you use the array syntax. If you want, as we will see, an object, you use brackets to create objects. And that is maybe the, the strange thing here for you. You're not used to just creating objects. You're used to creating a class of which you instantiate objects. But in JavaScript, this is an object. This is, this is just like writing let That is the same thing, but you will probably not see this way of writing it. You will see the object literal, which is the uh, brackets or what's, what are they called? Cur curly brackets. So that is an object. If I want a property on my object, I assign it the property. Now we have an object with a prop property called name, which has the value Joan. If I want another property, I add it like that. Simple, simple, simple. And this is where we will start, start off next time. Have you any questions? We have like 20 minutes. Yep. Yeah? How can I debug in Visual Studio Code? That's a good question. Um, should be as simple as doing that. Then we probably need to add a configuration. Um, I think we, maybe we do it like that. Add configuration. Whoa. Uh, we want node, we want to launch a program, and we want the program to launch a file. Yeah, that should be right. Uh, do I need to... No, save. Launch program, debug. Okay, close that one. Run. Yeah. You, the only thing is that you need to set it up. Uh, and then it should be pretty much as you are used to. Um, probably have shortcuts as well for those. You have your watch window, your call stack, the locals. Um, it, it's Microsoft, so I guess it's pretty. I think most that you need are there. I guess there are better, you could probably extend the debugger as well with plugins if, if you like. But yeah, it should work. Um, so, I mean, you could hook that up as well. If, if, if you don't want to, to write node test all the time, you could, of course, just run the debugger and run the code, if you like. Yeah? I think in the beginning of the lecture, you mentioned that standard for the indentation, the indentation of this code is three space bars. Two, two space bars. Space bars. Yep. Uh, can I modify that? Yeah. The, the, indent, the question is, in the, in the beginning of the course, I uh, uh, said that the standard says two uh, uh, space bar indentations. Um, in the settings, I guess we could in the there, editor tab space to uh, you edit that one, you will get it to your settings, save it to two, uh, stop the debugger. Don't let's see, yeah, so now it's two. So that, that setting should match the standard JS setting.
Mm. Go. You should uh, also specify the type uh, in the object. The, uh, for example, name, you can specify string. So the question is, could you specify the name that it should be a string? No. Okay. So it's the same thing here. It's loosely typed, so we don't specify the types. However, I'm pretty sure that in the not too long distance from now, we will probably have types in JavaScript as well as being added. I think there are proposals. Uh, a popular extension to JavaScript is TypeScript. That is kind of Microsoft's take on JavaScript. Um, works very well together with .NET, for instance. And in TypeScript, it's like JavaScript, but you have types. That's why it's called TypeScript. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure we will see types, more explicit types in, in, in JavaScript soon to be. But what I know we don't have in right now. However, when we, this is the very simplest way of creating an object. Uh, if you look at this one, and then we go to settings in Visual Studio Code, you will probably start recognizing things, right? Looks kind of like an object, and it is. So this is an object with properties. Um, this is called JSON. This, this syntax is called JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. It's like the new XML. I mean, you have probably seen it like everywhere because this is the way of configuring stuff. Um, and this is a JavaScript object. But we will get into that as well. So this is a really simple way of doing it. You could create objects more advanced, saying that you want to freeze things, that you want to have getters and setters, and yeah. But that's next lecture. OK, so I will finish now. Now you have like beginning to get a sense of what JavaScript is. You could start you, um, doing the first exercises if you like. The exercises are completely uh, um, uh, optional, but I recommend everybody do, to do them because they will kind of lead you into the examination assignment. Um, and I will be here for yet half an hour or so if you have any questions. Uh, other than that, I'll see you next week with lectures, the second part of this lecture. And remember that the hand-in for the first assignment is postponed to the 14th. I think it's thurs Thursday next week. Yeah. Okay, thank you.